What is up, my friends? I hope you're having a wonderful day. My name is Andrew. I have been practicing Vipassana meditation for the past five years, uh, almost to the day. Today's date is March 20, 27th, 2023. And I, my first course was on March 22nd, 2018. And over those five years, I've done five Vipassana courses. And so what I hope to tell you in this video, what I hope to communicate to you is just the difference that it has made in my life. Um, and it has been a very, very positive one. And I want to share that with you um, so that maybe you get a little curious about how this meditation works and maybe you feel inspired to uh, do something similar. Um, not for my sake, but for yours. I want to assure you there is no commercialism involved. There is no hidden interests here. I'm not, it doesn't matter to me. I'm not trying to convert you to a religion or to a way of thinking. Um, this is for you, you know? And uh, I just want to be very clear about that. Um, so, you know, you don't even, don't, don't like this video. Don't sign up to any email list. Don't subscribe. It does not matter, okay? That's not what I'm hoping to get out of this video. I'm hoping for you to get something out of this video. And I just want to be very clear about that. So five years. Wow, <laughs> what a change it has made in my life. Um, and one of the things I, I often encounter, today I'm a very experienced meditator, and I feel like I have a very balanced mind. Uh, I move through life with a sense of ease and acceptance. Um, and I often encounter people who think that I was always this way. And I want to caution you against thinking that way. Because five years ago, and more than five years ago, I was a completely different person. I was extraordinarily depressed, uh, often suicidal. Uh, when I first um, discovered meditation, I was, I was in a very, very bad spot. Um, and over those five years, I practiced and I worked on this meditation technique. And that is how I got the benefit and became the person who I am today. But it's not that I was always this way. I, I want to be very, very clear about that. Because you might look at a person like me and say, oh, I'm not like him. You know, I can't do what he's doing. Like, that's good for him that he has this meditation thing, but I, I can't do it. Not true at all. Not true at all. I was not always like this. And if you're feeling unhappy and depressed and stuff, um, first of all, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Um, and I want to help you um, change it. And I, I want to offer you this path. There are many, many paths. Um, and I want to also be very clear about that. There are many, many paths. This is just one path. A path that I have found works very, very well for me and for hundreds of thousands, probably millions at this point, um, of people as well. People who go on a 10-day Vipassana course. This is Vipassana with S.N. Goenka as the teacher in the tradition of Sayagi Yulakin. Um, there are many different kinds of Vipassana, but that's the kind of Vipassana I'm referring to. People go on a 10-day course, and man, in just 10 days, your whole life changes. Not that you become enlightened in 10 days, but the way that you understand reality shifts. There is a noticeable shift. And so, yeah, so anyway, that's kind of the overview. In this video, I'll give you kind of some of the details of my own journey, how I got from there to where I am today. What I understand now that I didn't understand then will be a very big part of this. Um, and yeah, just what does it look like to walk along this path? And yeah, so I, I hope you'll uh, join me. I hope you'll enjoy it. I've set a timer for one hour because I can talk forever about this stuff. So when the buzzer goes off, I promise to stop talking. I won't keep you here forever. One hour is plenty enough. Your time is valuable. So is mine. Um, but yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about. So. Um, let me tell you, I don't really have this super organized in my head, but, but we'll kind of figure it out as we go. Um, let me tell you, I think I'll start with my first course. Uh, again, before my for first course, I was very depressed. And I got inspired to go on my first course um, by other meditators. So, a little before my first course, I suppose. I first got introduced to meditation in December of 2016. Again, a very 
kind of negative time in my life. Um, but meditation kind of pulled me out of it. I was in a meeting with my therapist after having some sort of existential crisis, and I was telling him, oh, you know, like, it, everything feels insubstantial. Like, we're all going to die, so what is the point of all this commercialism? Uh, everyone's trying to sell me something, get my attention. Why? Why bother? Why bother? And that's not really a good place to be, um, <laughs> needless to say. Not, not that it's false. I, I think there's a lot of truth to it, but it's just not where you want your mind to be at for a long period of time. Um, to just be in a state of existential overwhelm, existential nothingness. Um, even if it is true, it's, <laughs> it's not the only way to see it, right? And so, my, my, um, and so I told this to my therapist, but then I said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for bringing it up, actually, I told him, because we're all going to die. You're going to die too, and I, I'm sorry for making you feel what I'm feeling. You know, I'm, I'm sorry for making you think about these things, too, because, again, they're not good things to be constantly thinking about. And he said, actually, it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, and I said, what? oh, interesting. You know, he said, well, you know, that's a hole you can go down into. Your mind gets stuck in a hole. And when you're in a hole, it's really scary. It's really dark. It's not a fun place to be. Uh, but it's possible to learn how to climb out of the hole. And I, I was like, huh, that's, that's kind of interesting. I hadn't, hadn't thought about it that way. And, and I asked him, how do, how do you climb out of the hole? And he says, well, I meditate. And I said, huh, never really thought about that. And, and I'm sure that I had heard the word meditation before, you know. But this time it hit me differently. Uh, maybe I was ready to receive it. I, I don't know. Um, but uh, for the first time in my life, in that specific moment, I identified within myself there was a desire to meditate. It just naturally came up. I was like, I, this is something I want to try. Um, you know, because the alternative was not good. <laughs> um, really, that, that was definitely the unhappiest time in my life. Um, and yeah, just not, not a good place to be. And, and again, if you're feeling that, I, I feel for you. And so coming out of that meeting, you know, I, I was introduced to meditation, not, not Vipassana meditation at that point, just meditation in general. Um, and so I, I started gathering some resources. I got some books, how to meditate, you know, simple books. A, a great book, Eight Minute Meditation by Victor, I want to say Ivanovich is his last name or, or something like that. Um, that was my introduction to meditation. All you need is eight minutes a day. Um, to do it. It doesn't need to be some sort of complicated thing. It's more just about bringing your attention back and bringing it back again and bringing it back again and bringing it back again. And that will be hard. Um, that's not something that just comes naturally. But over time, it is a skill that you can develop. And it's a skill that's very, very helpful. One of the things that my teacher says is nobody can help us more than our trained mind. And nobody can hurt us more than our untrained mind. And so training the mind, that becomes the question, right? And so I was introduced to meditation. I started doing these short eight-minute meditations. Fast forward about nine months, I went to grad school. In my grad school, I joined the meditation club. I was introduced to a community of meditators, and I started practicing a lot more. You know, having other people to practice alongside is very, very helpful. Other people working on the same things. A, a guide leading you in the same space as you is really helpful doing guided meditations. I really felt like I learned more about how to meditate. I th started feeling uh, presence more often. Um, and of course, presence is almost a buzzword, you know. Um, a, a feeling of lucidity and like all of my troubles, no matter how real they were, they felt insignificant compared to this clarity of mind that I could develop and more easily go into. And again, this is not, it's still not easy. You know, it was still maybe one day a month I would feel present for maybe an hour at most. And, and even that feels maybe like more than it actually was. I, I don't know. It's not easy, but it is worthwhile. And it was a new dimension was added to my life that was not there before. Decidedly, definitively, it was not there before I started doing that. So I, I started to notice there is change happening and it is real. And so 
when you notice that, it makes you just want to do it more, you know, because you realize this work is, something's happening here. And so the more you do it, the more it helps. So going to the meditation club, the vice president of the club was a Vipassana meditator. And so she was a, a wonderful um, girl, just very, very positive person, super friendly. Um, and she's the first Vipassana meditator I ever met, or that I ever knew that I met. Um, and so I, I, I was inspired by her before I knew that she practiced Vipassana. I, I just thought, wow, this, is, this person is different. You know, this person is really positive. This person is really friendly. I, I, I wonder how this person has cultivated their mind in such a way. And eventually I did discover, oh, she's a Vipassana meditator. She told me. And so she was going on her second course shortly after that, um, over like the spring break of the, of the college. And she was like, yeah, you should, you should come. You should try it out. You know, come and, come and see for yourself. And so I said, yeah, this interests me. Um, I, I want to be happy too, you know. Who doesn't want to be happy? And I was curious enough to, to try it out. And that's how I came onto my first course, March 22nd, 2018, right outside Dallas, Dallas Texas. Uh, and I've made videos about several of my courses on my YouTube channel. Um, you can hear me talk about those past experiences. See what I was like then and compare that to me now. If you're curious, you can do that. Um, you can see me five years ago and how I talk about these same topics. Um, and yeah, so to, to provide just a little bit of information in case you are curious about trying this for yourself. There's centers all over the world. Again, this is in the tradition of uh, Sayagi Yubakin, as taught by S.N. Galenka, the Pasana Meditation. There's 10-day courses. To start out, you have to do a 10-day course. Uh, after you do a 10-day course, you can do all sorts of other fun things. But to start, you have to do 10 days. There are centers all over the world. Uh, there are, I think, 12 in the U.S., or maybe 13. Um, 10, a few. There's, you know, about a dozen in the U.S., they're all over the world, though, um, and going for 10 days is free. There's no commercialism involved, and the reason for that is if you pay for this as a service, it creates an expectation in your mind. Oh, I paid such and such amount of money, I should get this out of it. We don't want anything like that, because this isn't about money. This is about happiness, you know, and that's invaluable. There's no dollar amount. Oh, I pay, a, you know, a thousand dollars, I should get this much happiness. That's not how happiness works. That's not how real happiness works, as I have come to understand. Um, and so, because of that, again, everything has to be offered very freely with purity of heart. And, and again, that is why I'm making this video. It's, it's not for me. I have no interest. I just want you to become happier. Um, so, yeah, so I found myself on my first 10-day course just outside of Dallas, Texas, um, at a place called Dama Siri. And for more information on courses, uh, you can visit www.dhamma.org. That's D-H-A-M-M-A dot O-R-G. Um, and so, yeah, so I found myself at Dama Siri alongside... Uh, probably about 100 other meditators, maybe more than that, maybe 120, 130 other meditators. Pretty big center. And as a new meditator, I was sitting all the way in the back of the hall. I'll tell you about my first course now. I was sitting all the way in the back of the hall. And I, I think I was seat H5 or something. And so the, the H is the row. So A, first row, second B, second row. It's all the way in the back. And so there's all these meditators in front of me. And so, you know, going through this experience, it's a silent retreat, and you're meditating uh, about ten and a half hours every single day, um, which is challenging. <laughs> to say the least, it is challenging. Because you don't ever get a chance to really get into that space in normal life, in society. You know, you don't get ten days of silence. You don't get ten hours of meditation. Um, and it is challenging. It is the hardest thing I've ever done, um, by far. 
but also the most meaningful and, and most beneficial. Um, so on that first course, I struggled so much. You know, I, I cried every single day on my first course. Um, and not just like, uh, <laughs> like I was weeping, you know. There's, there's a, a great meditation teacher once, I forget, I forget which one, uh, but once said, if you've never wept, you've never truly meditated. Uh, which I think is a beautiful way of putting it. Now, why? Why, why, why? That is the question, right? You experience reality in a different way. And as I now understand, it's not, it's not the things that happen in your life that determine how happy you are or how, ha how happy you are not. Similarly, it's not the things in your life that determine if you, you should cry or you should not cry. But rather, it's your reaction to them. And of course, New Age, people will say that all the time. It's how you see it, man. Um, there's some truth to it. It gets kind of polluted when, you know, pe people don't always see what they're really saying there. But, but there is a lot of truth to that, you know. What you can see when you really focus your mind is that reaction pattern. For example, um, let's say someone cuts you off in traffic and you feel so angry, you feel so agitated. Well, as it turns out, the reason you feel angry and agitated is not because someone cut you off in traffic, it's because there's a feeling somewhere in your body that that created, someone cut you off in traffic and you developed a feeling in your body and now you're reacting to that feeling. And so the reason of Vipassana course is so hard is because now you're developing awareness of the body and you're feeling that feeling. You take away the, the sensory input. The sensory input doesn't matter. The feeling is what matters. And you feel this incredible pain in your body that brings you to tears, you know? Because that is the nature of misery. The nature of misery is not that it's from the external world. It's from the internal world. And yeah, that was the first time I ever really experienced that. On my, was on my first course. And it's not, it's not, it's not an easy thing to, um, to, to go through. You know, it's very, very difficult to let yourself feel that willingly. But you have to understand, letting yourself feel that willingly lets you change the habit of your mind. Because this time, when you feel this incredible pain you say, no, I will stay focused, I will stay balanced, I will not react, and you try your best. That's all we can ever hope for. It is incredibly difficult, but you try your best, and over time you get better and better at it, as I can now attest after so many courses. On that first course I was in so much d distress, emotional pain, because I was still reacting to it. The crying and the weeping and the anger and, you know, all the feelings are ultimately reactions to these feelings in the body. Now, so many of those things are negative. You feel pain and you feel something like anger. You hate the pain. You feel hatred. You say, ah, oh, this pain, I want it to go away. You feel fear, perhaps. You feel, ah, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? I feel this pain. What, what's, you know, it can also go in, in a different sense. It can also go... Uh, like craving. For example, you feel something really good. You feel some really pleasant sensation in the body, and the, the mind's habit is to say, ooh, I want more of this, I want more of this, I want more of this. But eventually you realize that that too hurts you, because the, the pleasant feeling, you have attachment to it. Uh, ultimately, what this comes down to is developing two things. Awareness and equanimity. Equanimity means non-reaction, a, a sort of balance of the mind. Awareness first. You feel these things in your body all the time. They come from your subconscious mind, your unconscious mind. The mind is a very deep thing, right? And most of what we experience in reality is really just the surface level reality, the apparent reality, the obvious reality. And you don't get to see this deeper part of your mind. But that deeper part of your mind is always there, and it's always active, and it's always paying attention inside the body. It's always paying attention to sensations. 
which are also always there. So you have to develop your awareness to feel it in the first place, to move past what is obvious about the world to what is subtle about the body, what is subtle about my experience of reality. And so to do that, again, it takes silence, it takes a, a lot of dedicated, serious meditation. But I assure you, it is possible. And it is something, if you ever go on a 10-day course, it is something you will experience, a significant deepening of your awareness. For reference, pardon the background noise, I, I have a fan over here also. I live in a very hot country. For reference, on my fifth course, and, and over my third and fourth course as well, um, you know, these, these qualities develop. My awareness is developed very, very significantly. Um, to the point where, what's the longest I've gone with an un un uninterrupted flow state of, of consciousness? Probably like, probably about three or four hours of just uninterrupted concentration. Perhaps even longer than that. It really de depends how you define uninterrupted, you know, concentrated state of, of mind. Because... Thoughts don't end, but the way that you react to them does. Um, so it's possible to have thoughts and still be very concentrated. And so if you think of it that way, I mean, you could say that I've been extraordinarily concentrated for you know, days at a time. Um, but in any, way, in, in any case, it doesn't really matter. The point is that it develops. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. So even if you're watching this and you're like, oh gosh, I can't even concentrate and listen to this guy for 20 minutes... <laughs> Um, you, you get better at it, you know? What matters is not how, what matters is not where you at are at right now, what matters is where you want to go, you know? Do you actually want to develop these qualities within yourself? Do you hear me talking about these things and you feel curious? You want to learn more, you want to try it? Do it! You will not regret it, I assure you. So that's awareness. You start to feel subtler and subtler reality. You start to feel this unconscious part of the mind that's always there, but that you're never really seeing. And uh, that makes all the difference. Then the other part is equanimity, which again, is like non-reaction. You cultivate the balance of your mind by, by non-reacting, by, by not reacting. Because again, you feel all these pains and these pleasurable sensations within the body. You, you make your attention very, very sharp and you go very, very deep into the mind. And this unconscious, excuse me, this unconscious mind is so reactive, so much attachment to wanting only good, not wanting bad, wanting to see the world my way, wanting the world to suit me. That's not how the world works. The mind of an experienced meditator, the mind of Buddha, is not that everything always goes his way. It's not that you always get what you want. It's not that the way that you see the world is even right, necessarily. But what it is, is you're okay with that. It's a big difference. Very big difference. Even in Buddha. Buddha is not, it's, it's not some magical power. I can get everything I ever wanted. It's... I have no attachment to things being this way or that way. I'm okay with whatever happens. Not just at the surface, apparent level, but at the entire level, at every single level, at the deepest level and everywhere in between. Because it is that attachment you will find, or I have found at the very least, it is that attachment to things being this way and not that way that creates all the suffering in life. In my life, that is certainly proven to be the case. And so developing equanimity means now you don't care so much that things are this way or that way. You know, if you feel a pain, you say, okay, there's pain, no problem. I will not react. You feel pleasure, you say, oh, no, I will not crave this. Because you see, <clears throat> you come to see so clearly that these reactions are what create your misery. And you start to see that coming out of these reactions ends your misery. You feel real, pure happiness. And so once you can see that, the work becomes a, a, a lot easier. Because the more you see that, the more you say, okay, I'm not going to react. It's not good for me. It's like eating junk food, you know? Maybe it's pleasurable right now, but later I'm going to regret it, right? And so put faith in that, you know? 
make your efforts, build your efforts around that, and you'll get somewhere real quick. You'll, you'll, you'll feel real good real fast. Not because of some sensation, but because you're free to accept life as it comes to you. You're free to accept the terms of life. The reason people crave and have hatred and aversion towards these feelings is ultimately, and, and I don't want to offend anyone when I use this word, that's, that, that's not the point, but ultimately is an ignorance of this truth. Because deep down we can all we can all, we can all see it, you know. It's obvious intellectually. Everything changes. Everybody knows that. Come on, everything changes. It's obvious. Everybody who was born dies, right? Everyone who gets something, you know, maybe maybe they lose it eventually. It's obvious, but only at the apparent level. Deeper down, we don't believe it. We don't know it. We ignore it deeper down, and we say no. My but. Everything is, is impermanent, but my pleasure should be permanent. And my pain should, should not be, my pain should end as soon as possible. Ignorance. That's ignorance of what we know to be true. The truth is, pleasure comes and goes, pain comes and goes. And to pass through that experience without clinging and without wanting things to be a certain way is true freedom. And that that is what we are cultivating with equanimity. Um, and I have a couple notes over to my left here. Okay. So on that first course, very difficult course, but you try your best. That's all we can ever hope to do. Um, okay, my phone is telling me we started a new video. That's okay. I'll, I'll edit later. That's all we can hope to do is to do our best, and what matters is, again, not what level you are at, but rather your desire to go further. Lean into that. If you want to be happy, at least give this a shot. Maybe it's not the right path for you, maybe it is. If you hear what I'm saying, though, and you're curious about it, the only way to really kind of understand what I'm talking about here is to, to see for yourself. This will be the apparent reality. You hearing me talking about it, you'll, you'll think, oh, okay, that makes sense, that makes sense, but you're not feeling it inside your body. Over the course of my five courses, since that first course, I felt it within my body more and more, you know, um, automatically. Whenever the sensation arises, I have that awareness more available, more, more readily available, so that I can say, hey, there's a, there's a sensation. And I have the equanimity more to say, I should not react to this sensation. This sensation is misery. And so going on a course for 10 days, you go very deep into that. Now what happens when you go home? Well, after that first course, I tried to continue uh, these practices uh, with some... With some luck with some good results. Um, I practiced every day for, for quite a bit of time. Um, I remained sober for quite a long period of time. A, a lot of my craving uh, was associated with uh, marijuana addiction in the past. Um, so being able to observe the sensations instead of reacting to them. Previously my reaction was smoke, smoke marijuana, smoke weed. But then it became, well, what happens if I don't, I, I don't, I started to develop the feeling of, this feeling is here, but I don't need to smoke weed. I can just let the feeling be here. You know, I don't need to, to react. And when you come off a course, that feeling is very strong, that, that awareness is very strong, that equanimity is very strong. Over time, the, the mind naturally kind of comes down a little bit. Because we're living in a world of ego, you know? We're living in a world where we have responsibilities and money and uh, desires and a heck of a lot of stimulus that makes us want certain things, want the world to be a certain way, resist some people, want some people, want certain, uh, I don't know, even things like food, you know? If you go to a restaurant in the US, my home country, you'll usually be given so much more food than you actually need. Why? Because you want 
more food than you actually need. It's the craving. It's not about the food. It's not about the sensory experience. It's about your reactions. Um, not just the U.S. That, that's everywhere. That Restaurants seem to give more food than is needed. But it's certainly widespread in the U.S. Um, and the other thing is, you know, everyone around you is probably doing some version of craving and aversion and hatred and loving this and hating that because everyone lives in sort of their own little self-centered bubble. Not self-centered in any sort of morally, you know, negative way. I'm not trying to cast any judgment on anybody. No way of thinking is better than any other here. What I am hoping to communicate to you, though, is the default setting of the mind is to be self-centered. I am at the dead center of every single experience I ever have. And so because of that, at the apparent level, I should gratify the self endlessly. If you look closely, though, if you really search for that more subtle level, you'll realize that that is not satisfying. That is not... That is not a happy way to live. You'll never be satisfied. Let's say you love money. How much is enough? You make $100,000, now you want a million. You make a million dollars, now you want 10 million. You make 10 million, now you want 100 million. You, make, you know, you're never satisfied. Why? Because the reality inside, the craving, is not changed. You were reacting to it when you wanted more, from 100,000 to 1 million. Now you have a million, you're still reacting to it, you still want more. It has nothing to do with what's outside. So, it's things like that that really kind of, um, it's easy, to, th those are sort of what you can come out of through the spiritual path, but it's very interesting to note that when we do go about an ordinary, normal life, it's somewhat natural for those things to become the habit pattern of the mind. And that's why I've gone on five Vipassana courses and not just one. You don't just do this once and you're good forever. But these impurities start coming back in the mind, these reactions start coming back in the mind, and you start to notice faster. You start to notice more, more quickly, oh, there's a sensation, and I'm reacting to it, and I'm creating misery for myself, as you go about your daily life in the world. And so then, you, once you've sort of noticed this, whether consciously or unconsciously, you start to think, oh, I should purify the mind again. And that's when you start saying, oh, I want to go on another Vipassana course. I want to try again uh, and go deeper with it. So my second course, I did just that. Um, my second course was in August of 2019. Uh, same center, Dhamma Siri, in just outside Dallas, Texas. Really lovely place. One of my favorite centers. Um, and on this second course, I'm still sitting pretty far in the back. It's a big center, so they get a lot of pretty experienced meditators sitting in front of you. Now, in the meditation, it's so difficult, and so, let's say you're struggling. If you're sitting in the back, you open your eyes, and you just see people concentrated, meditating, sitting up straight, and they inspire you to work harder, you know? If you, if you open your eyes and everyone else is like, what? what's going on? You know, it's, it's, not, it's not helpful. It, it won't inspire you. You know, but to be in that environment where you're surrounded by people who are experienced meditators, you kind of get inspired by them. And so on that second course, I remember I was still sitting near the back. There was a guy in the front row. I later talked to him. He had been on seven courses. That was his seventh course. And he was always, it felt like he was always meditating. Whenever I got into the hall, he was already sitting there. He's already, he's already doing it. Uh, and, you know, meditation ends, we get up, take a short break, and then you come back after a short break, he's already there. But <laughs> how, did he, how did he go so fast? And so what I realized is, in the mind of a very experienced meditator, you don't resist the meditation itself so much. Um, when you're a new meditator, it hurts so much, you are reacting, and you resist it. I mean, I remember thinking to myself on... I think it was my first course. Like, I felt so much pain and so much, ah! And I was just like, okay, okay, but just get me, 
inside the meditation hall. Like, I, I know I'm freaking out, but just, just get, all I need is for my feet to walk in the door because I, I felt so much resistance to the meditation, but I, I knew that by meditating, I would come out of it, things would change. The reality always changes. You're experiencing the changing nature of reality. And so, uh, consciously or unconsciously, it doesn't matter, you're deepening that experience. And so I was like, ah, but just get me inside. And so I got into the meditation hall, and sure enough, it always it clears, you know, because it changes, and you observe that change. But anyway, so this, this guy sitting in the front row, you know, he really inspired me. He made me realize it's all in your head. This resistance... It's all in your head. You, don't, you have nothing to fear about this meditation. Um, and it's not just when you're on a meditation course and you're freaking out. It's in life, too. If you fear this meditation, there's a good chance that there's resistance in your mind, that you don't really want to do this meditation, or you're not sure about this meditation. And people will attach a reason to it for one reason or another, a, a sensory example or a philosophical example, or whatever it is. And again, it's, it's really not the external reality that does that, it's the internal reality. Inside, you are afraid. Let me give you an example. So one of my friends, he likes to dabble in different spiritual philosophies and things like that. Vipassana is not about philosophies, it's not about spiritual games and mind games and things like that, it is only about reality. But this guy, he studies Buddhism, teaching a Buddha, oh, it's very good, it's very good, but what's this reincarnation? I don't think I believe in reincarnation. And I say, fine, don't believe in reincarnation, it doesn't, doesn't matter. The, the teaching of Buddha is if you practice meditation, you will get benefit immediately. Not, you will get benefit after the life ends as well, sure, no doubt, but in this very life, immediately, you will feel even just 1% better even just a fraction of a percent better. Immediately, you will get the benefits of meditation. And by the way, this is not Buddhist meditation. It draws a lot of inspiration from Buddha, but it, is not, it has nothing to do with organized religion, just to be clear. People of all faiths come to these courses, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, you name it. It's, it's good for all. It's universal, what you practice here. And so anyway, so he says, you know, this... this uh, Reincarnation, I don't, I don't think I believe in it. And he uses this as an excuse to ignore everything else Buddha says. Uh, if he's wrong about that, he must be wrong about everything. I, I, I shouldn't bother. Madness. Madness. Take what makes sense to you. But, but if, understand that if you, if you fear or doubt this meditation, you're resisting inside something. There's something inside that is causing you to feel that way. It's not that the meditation itself is bad or impure or whatever. It's that you have some sort of internal thing that's causing you to feel a certain way. You will, in other words, you will find a reason to not do this meditation if you feel doubt or fear or any of the five hindrances, actually. But that's a whole other topic. We don't need to get into that too much right now. Maybe later. Um, so what matters is just, just have enough faith that you can go for 10 days. If this makes sense to you, if you're curious about it, it's 10 days. Okay? And after 10 days, take all your beliefs back. It's fine. Don't, don't even worry about it. If, if, if you say, I, you know, I'm a... If you say that you are a drug addict and this meditation sounds good, but I don't want to stop my addiction, all you have to do is 10 days, and then you can have your addiction back. Go for it. You know, once you go home, you are your own master. But for 10 days, you come out of it, you work seriously on this, on this meditation. So I forget uh, where I was going with that. Oh yeah, so I was very inspired by this guy. And there have been other people along my path who have inspired me, like that, that girl who uh, introduced me to Vipassana, this fellow on my second course. On my first course, there, there's another meditator who I knew who had been on like five courses. And wow, just the strength with, with which, you know, you could see her holding her posture like, like a needle, you know, and, and sitting for three hours at a time. And I'm like, wow, she must, I can't even imagine what that person's feeling, you know. But I'm curious about it. I hope to get there someday. Well, I did, you know. You just keep, just keep going. 
That's the message. Just keep going. It's not always easy, but, but, but it's worthwhile. So, second course. It's a good course. I went a little further than my first course. On my first course, I felt almost all pain. I, I, you know, the teacher, my meditation teacher, S.N. Goenka, he talks about, you know, if you feel these pleasant sensations and get a free flow, just make sure you don't develop any attachment. And on my first course, I'm like, there's pleasant sensations? All I feel is just, ah, just so much pain. Uh, I never felt any pleasant sensations on my first course. At least I don't remember feeling any. Um, on my second, I, I might have felt a bit few, uh, but certainly not very many. On my third course... I started feeling a few pleasant sensations. Um, this free flow of attention, like a smoothness to the mind. There's no blockage to your attention. You're moving your attention throughout your body. And if it moves very smoothly and very concentratedly, then your mind is usually quite clear in those moments. Um, because the, what does it, this is a manifestation of your equanimity, of your non-reaction. That will kind of dictate to some degree uh, what the sensations are that, that you're feeling. It, it kind of represents in the body what you're feeling in the mind. The mind and the body, so very connected, of course. Um, and now you're experiencing it. So anyway, I started to feel the, the pleasant sensations. And I remember one night, uh, and, and I remember one night having a very nice meditation where I feel, oh, yes, so good, so good. Uh, this is around day six out of the ten days. And then day seven, it's all this pain again, the evening again of day seven, because I was like, well, usually my evening meditations are at least better than the rest of the day. And so then the following day, nope, no more pleasant sensation, all pain. And then you come to realize, oh, these pleasant sensations are, are misery too, because I had attachment to things being in a positive way, in a, in a pleasant way, and now it's not pleasant, and I'm craving, I'm, I'm wanting it, I'm resisting the pain, I'm wanting the pleasant. And so then you come to realize that pleasant sensations can also be a form of misery. That's very important as you go about your life. Sometimes things that feel good make you unhappy. That's very important. It's a lot harder to see that than things that feel bad make you unhappy. Sometimes things that feel good make you unhappy. For example, let's say you know, you're very promiscuous. You're having a lot of sexual relations with a lot of people. Perhaps that feels very good. But if you look, it's, it's like the large meals I was talking about before. It's like, if you look at the more subtle level, it, it, it doesn't feel good because you don't feel satisfied. Not the large meals example, the, the money example. You always want more and more and more, but you're never satisfied. Um, and one of the things that very commonly comes up on meditation courses is, of course, you know, sexual desire. All sorts of negativity come up. That, that one is certainly no exception. Anger comes up. Uh, you know, wh whatever negativity you have, fear, doubt, sadness, different forms of craving and aversion. Just let things be as they are. The way out is through. Again, a cliche. What does it actually mean in your experience of the body? I'm not talking about, you know, oh yeah, the way out is through. You know, you just, yeah, you just do the thing and you'll be fine. No. In your experience of the body, do you know, not intellectually, but in the body, that what arises ends? And therefore, the way out is through. The way out is by watching it arise and watching it end. That is through. You see it come, you see it go. The way out is through. Experiencing that in terms of sensations and not reacting. The way out is through, I mean, you don't react. If you react, then you're not, you're not going through, right? So, easier said than done. But you can experience this as true if you really set your mind to it. Um, yeah, I'm just checking my little... Here. Got about uh, like 15 minutes left or so to, to give you all my wisdom, <laughs> all the wisdom that I can fit into one hour. Um, and if you have any questions, please leave, leave your question. I'm happy to, to answer 
whatever it is, you know, the, the meditation, uh, the path should be very, very clear. Um, if you have problems with this meditation, it should not be because you're confused about it, at least at the theoretical level. At the experiential level, it can get confusing um, because it's not always clear what you're feeling. You know, you're looking for the sensation, you're like, what, what's that? I don't know what that is. But uh, over time, it becomes more clear as you develop more awareness, more equanimity. But at first, when your awareness and your equanimity are not very developed, it can, it can get confusing. The meditation itself can get confusing. But, but how to meditate uh, should not be confusing. Moving the attention through the body, awareness and equanimity. I'm not a teacher in this meditation. I, I have no interest in teaching this meditation to you right now. Um, if you want to learn it, please go on a 10-day course, because that is how you will get the most benefit from it. Um, so anyway, that was my third course. In, in between these, also, I had served a course uh, in January 2020. I served a course, that is, I worked as a volunteer in the kitchen, uh, cooking, cleaning, etc., to help support the meditators who were on the course. Again, the courses are free. Everything is freely offered. All the people who work there are volunteers, including the teacher himself. He gets no money from this. Um, it's just to give the meditation, just to give what's called dhamma, which is sort of a, a way of thinking about it, just so that you get that. And if you get that, I will be more satisfied than any money you could ever give me. I do not have attachment to money. I don't even have attachment to people getting dhamma. But I don't want people to suffer for no reason. I don't want people to suffer out of ignorance. And that includes you, because this is universal. So after, yeah, after my second course in January 2020, I served a course, which was a very lovely experience. After that, I started meditating two hours every single day. Serving a course, I found, helped so much with daily practice. As you go about your life, uh, you know, you're picking up these negativities, then in daily practice, I meditate two hours a day, in, in daily practice, you pull out the impurities. That's what Vipassana is all about. You pull out the impurities. You pick them up, and it's normal to pick them up in daily life, but then you need to pull them out. That is real happiness and real freedom, is to live without so much stuff inside going on. Um, to be clear, it's not that this makes you less emotional. In fact, it makes you more emotional. It's like, um, it's like an itch. If you don't scratch the itch, it gets stronger, not weaker. I mean, eventually it goes away. But emotion is the same way. If I feel, oh, so sad, so sad, so sad, so agitated, I'm not letting myself go deeper into the sadness and really feeling it for what it is. And so naturally this gets very difficult because you go so deep into sadness, you go so deep into fear, you go so deep into sexual desire, you go so deep into anger, but you start to see them for what they really are, which is impermanent. And that's, that makes all the difference, truly. Um, after my third course, I served an, another course. Uh, the, so my third course was in uh, September 2020. Then I served another course in, uh, I want to say February, or maybe March, I think March, 2021. Yes, and my mom sat on that course. I, I, told, I told my parents about this meditation technique. I told them I really wanted them to do it to help bring them out of their own miseries, their own struggles of life. Again, it's universal. Um, and my mom was curious enough to try it. She said, yes, this sounds good. And she came to the course. I, I worked in the kitchen while she worked in the meditation hall, you know, working to... And uh, it, was, it was very beautiful to support her in that. And she became a lot happier as a result. She started meditating every day. Now, don't expect perfection from yourself and from other people. I don't expect my mom to be, like, the most perfect meditator ever. That's not what matters. What matters is the effort, you know? Um... So, yeah, she meditates at home, but it's not like she's, she's Buddha all of a sudden. Like, no, that's not the point. Buddha is kind of an ideal, but every step that you take towards that ideal is a step that makes you happier. So, it's not if you're enlightened or not. Because there, you could be here, and that's happier than here. Does that make sense? I, I, I hope that makes sense. The closer you come to enlightenment, the closer you come to happy, to real, true happiness, the closer you come to truth and 
real compassion and, and equanimity and all these things. It's not, a, it's not a binary. It's not zero or one. It's a quality that you develop. And going on a Vipassana course is the surest way that I know to develop all sorts of very useful, very positive qualities that are both good for you and good for other people. My fourth course, so in between my second serve and my fourth course, um, I moved to Thailand. Um, it's a whole other story. We could talk about it another time. Um, and so my fourth course, I sat in Thailand, uh, in, in Pitsan Yulo, a city in central Thailand, a very, very hot place, especially in the month of April 2022 when I sat there. Um, oh my goodness, so hot, so, so hot, um, and no air conditioning, no, none of that. Sitting still, I was getting covered in sweat, <laughs> and I was getting so angry, because it's the sensation that you're reacting to, it's the sensation and the reaction to it that creates anger and fear and passion and, and you know, all these things, passion that is sexual desire. And um, so, you know, I was getting so angry at this heat and this sweat, and it taught me a lot to sit there and just know it is a normal, natural phenomenon. Do not react. It is impermanent to let there be heat, let there be perspiration. Why should I care? Why should I care if I'm sweaty or not? So that was, uh, <laughs> that was extraordinarily challenging, but I learned very much from it. <clears throat> Excuse me. After my fourth course, I eventually did a Satipatthana Sutta course, which is a special nine-day course. It's a lot like a ten-day course, but only for sort of more experienced meditators to dive deeper into the technique, the philosophy, not the philosophy, the theory of the meditation. When I say theory of meditation, I mean sort of what we're talking about right now. How does this meditation really work? What's really happening? One of those, uh, what part of the theory, for example, is you develop the mindfulness, you develop the awareness of not just the sensations, but the qualities of the mind itself, including the five nivernas, the five hindrances, craving, aversion, restlessness, uh, torpor, like sleepiness, and doubt. Those five things will be one of the things that stops you, or maybe there will be more than one at any given time, but you notice when those things are present. And, and so, for example, on this fifth course, I uh, would be meditating, and I would be feeling good equanimity, which is one of the five friends, five positive qualities, faith, awareness, effort, equanimity, or really wisdom, and concentration. I'd, I'd be aware, okay, I have uh, doubt in my mind, but I also have equanimity in my mind at the same time, and they're kind of, it's almost like they're fighting each other, you know, and, and on this fifth course, my most recent course, I'm finally coming to the present moment, 53 minutes into this uh, very long one-hour video. <laughs> are, are you still with me? I, I hope you're still with me. Um, and again, let me know if you have any questions, either in the comments, send me a message, feel free to reach out. Um, anyway, I would be aware when I had equanimity and I would be aware when I had doubt. And, and often I would be aware of these two things kind of fighting it out. And, and on this fifth course, I reached a, a state of such I was just having breakthroughs in terms of the equanimity I was feeling. All the stuff that I had been developing for like four or five courses at this point, five if you include Satipatthana, all of it was coming to fruition. Because in the past, I was like, yeah, I, I, I kind of, you know, want to do the meditation. I kind of want to work hard at this. But there's a lot of hindrance. There's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of resistance to it. On this fifth course, there was so much less resistance, and it felt so amazing to have reached the point that I'm at today, because it's no longer, should I meditate? It's more, how do I meditate? This meditation is good for me, I'm going to do it, and I'm, I'm going all in. Um, and, and that is a really big shift, and that's really what I, kind of the breakthrough that I had. Um, and it's, at the apparent level, it feels like that was just on this course. In reality, I was building that on every single course. And if you go on courses, you will too. Every single course, it adds up. You lose nothing. Maybe if you wait, I don't know, 20 years between courses, you might lose a little bit. I don't know. But, you know, it's recommended that you do one a year 
for returning students, and that's why. If you do one a year, you will lose nothing. Do not worry. Um, and it just keeps building. And so I reached these, these really amazing places that that poor, depressed, suicidal kid five or six years ago could not have imagined. I never saw any of this coming. I hope, I hope that's clear. Like, if you're, if you're watching this and you're like, yeah, like, he's, you know, he, he did it, but I'm not like him. No, I never saw any of this coming. Genuinely. Just keep going. That's all I did. That's all I recommend you do. Keep going if you're curious about it. And if you're curious about it, give 10 days. Do, do your 10-day course. And if, if you hate it, if you think it sucks, if you have no belief in this whatsoever, then let, let it go. But, but don't just dismiss it without having experienced it. Because I think on some level you might feel some truth towards what I'm talking about. Perhaps. And so when I, when I look at the path that I've taken, it feels like I am becoming inspiration. Um, certain qualities have developed in me, right? And so I went from being that kid at the back of the meditation hall looking at the others to now being the guy at the front of the meditation hall. You know, on this past course I was in the second row. And for several of my past courses I've made very strong effort, developed that, that, that uh, ability to give an effort, to, to do effort. And um, having developed that, people now look at me and they, see, they can see that. You know, now I'm the guy at the med front of the meditation hall and people come to me and they say, wow, you were meditating so well, you, you sat so, you know, so straight, straight back and, you know, you, you gave such an effort and it inspired, it, now it inspires other people as I hope to inspire you. In the same way that that girl inspired me to go on my first course, in the same way that so many other meditators have inspired me to just keep going. I, I owe everything to them, you know. And the best that I could ever hope for is to be that to someone else. And, and, I, and I'm fortunate because I have been that to several other people. Some of my friends have, have gone, my mom has gone, and they found so much benefit in this, in this dhamma, in this technique. Um, and yeah, I want, I want everybody to be happy. I, like, I'm just more and more compassion develops. You develop 10, what are called, bar, barami, parmi. Uh, they're, virtues, essentially. The Buddha taught there are ten perfections of an enlightened person. And I don't have time to, to go in detail on all of these. Maybe I'll make another video at some point, or feel free to ask. But those, let's see if I can remember all of them. Uh, renunciation, generosity, truth, effort, equanimity, compassion, patience or tolerance, kamti. Um, what else do we have? Morality? Did I say morality? Wisdom? And what's the last one? And aditan, determination. Determination has been one of the most surprising for me. When I say just keep going, that's determination. And again, I saw none of this coming. I had so many doubts. Determination is what got me over that. Um, and I've developed all these qualities. If you ever go on a Vipassana course, you will always develop every single one of these qualities to varying degrees. Um, it's always reality at every step of the way. That's kind of the, the interesting thing here. So let me see if I have a short minute or two. I think, yeah, that's, that's, that's all the topics I wanted to talk about. The more you do it, the more you will see reality as it really is. In fact, the meaning of the word Vipassana is to see things as they really are. At the apparent level, you will see certain truths, like, again, I did. Uh, it appears that the world is meaningless and it's substantial and all this craving and aversion, it's like, that's the apparent uh, truth, that we should live that way. But if, if the more subtle truth is, no, there's another way to live. The more subtle truth is, I don't need money, I don't need status, I don't need popularity. Why develop attachments to these things? All of these things are impermanent. And when you really understand that, in the way that you approach the world, the way that you live your life, it changes everything. 
absolutely everything. Do not fear that it will change you for the worse. If you want certain negativities, keep them, whatever. If you want to cling to a certain worldview, it's not going to challenge your worldview. But what it might do is teach you to look a little closer at it. And then, and then you may decide to change it on your own. But you don't have to. Nothing here is forced. So, yeah, I'm proud of myself. I mean, I, I'm happy, you know. Um, pride is kind of irrelevant. I'm happy that I'm happy. Um, so, I hope you feel what I am feeling. I hope you develop in your own way, whether it's in this practice or another. I hope that it leads you to real happiness. No illusions, no delusions, no mind games. It's not about philosophy, at least for me, it's not about philosophy. Why? Because intellectual truth, oh yeah, I think it's this way and this way. Oh yeah, I guess that makes sense. It's different than experiential truth how you experience the world. Have to make that jump. No attachment to thought and views. And yeah, I, I, the time, the buzzer rang, so I, I'll, I'll say goodbye here. But um, yeah, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I really, really just genuinely want to help. Um, and I hope you found this good. I hope you found this to be a good use of an hour. <laughs> um, and yeah, feel free to, to um, let me know any questions or, or give any feedback or, or whatever you feel. Um, I'm, I'll probably make some more videos here on YouTube, on my Instagram, whatever. Uh, feel free to subscribe. It doesn't matter to me if you do or if you don't. But again, it's all for you. So if you if you like what I'm talking about here, feel free to sign up and, and you know get more. There's more of it coming. Um, but in the meantime, be very well, be very happy, with lots of love. Take care.